Hey everybody, so Dungeons and Dragons, Art and Arcana, A Visual History by Michael Whitwer, Kyle Newman, John Peterson, and Sam Whitwer. This thing is a beast. I absolutely love it. It's great. Go buy it. Done. Review over. It's amazing. First, I should tell you where I'm coming from with this. I haven't played D&D since the 80s. I, I loved it as a kid. I think I stopped playing around second edition. After that, I played a bit of, uh, you know, Baldur's Gate, a bit of DDO, but that's about it. I read a lot of the Dragonlance books, and I went through a ton of uh, Forgotten Realms comics. But other than that, I've kind of punched out. However, I absolutely love the art. Uh, growing up, this stuff, especially Larry Elmore, like this exact piece here is basically my childhood in an image. This just really shaped me, I think, creatively, artistically, whatever you want to call it up into my adulthood. I absolutely love it. The only other thing I've had to do with D&D uh, in my adult life was I, I did some um, Worlds of Dungeons and Dragons comics. Uh, not something I'm particularly proud of. Uh, it's kind of a shame too because after all these years I get to play in this sandbox and I, I, I'm gonna blame it on the fact that I had a full-time job and it was like a side gig. Also, I thought they would have an inker. I did the pencils, assuming that somebody would ink it, but they didn't. They just scanned the pencils and I don't know. I don't even think they paid me, actually. But that's, I don't know. That's neither here nor there. Let's not get into that. The uh, life as a, as a comic artist, what a goofy thing. Anyhow. This book is fantastic. So one thing that I should tell you right off the bat is that it's 450 pages. That's an obvious technical thing. It's big, it's heavy, you know, it's, it's a beast. So what does that mean? That's great, right? Yes, however, if you're ordering this from Amazon, I'd be a little bit careful. I'd be a bit wary about ordering it from Amazon. What I have noticed lately, I don't know if it's like this where you guys are, but big, beefy, kind of expensive books like this, when they arrive from Amazon, they're tossed into a box with a little bubble thing and then that's it, and then it slams around and bangs around. So if you have a big, giant, heavy thing like this that you're ordering from Amazon, there's a good chance it's gonna show up with like dinged up corners and stuff like that, which you're really not gonna appreciate because it's kind of a, you know, it's sort of a, a coffee table type, big, sexy thing. and. Although I, I do think that the true value of this book, like all D&D &D books, comes from uh, throwing it in a backpack, abusing the heck out of it, walking around with it in that backpack, banging around, getting all dinged up, and um, leaving it out in the rain, getting some water damage on it. And then it truly becomes a proper D&D book, you know, and something that looks like it's actually been through an adventure. That to me is what all D&D books should look like. But you might not want that to happen from the Amazon warehouse to your house. So just be aware of that. Maybe go to your local comic shop or something, game shop, get it from them. The binding on this, it is, it's good, right? The binding is good. It's a big high quality book with good binding. But you also have to realize that binding in current year, if it's an eight, which I guess this would be, let's say it's an eight out of 10 for binding, that's very different than binding in 1980. I, I think that this binding in 1980 would be about a four. So is it a high quality book for current year? Yeah, absolutely. But will it last? Will it survive getting dinged around in your backpack for ages? I don't know. Let's just see how many of just this, how much of this can it take? You know, how many, how much teenage, preteen abuse can this thing really take? I don't know. I, I really, I really don't know. Either way, let's get into the book itself. Here's their description of the book. An illustrated guide to the history and evolution of the beloved role-playing game told through the paintings, sketches, illustrations, and visual ephemera behind its creation, growth, and continued popularity. And that's what this is. It's a mashup of material over the decades, and the layout itself, it's all over the place, which is great. You think it's chaotic, you think it's nonsensical, uh-uh, just hear me out on this. The, the chaos in here is actually a good thing. What this does is it keeps your eye constantly moving. It looks like everything was maybe thrown into a bucket and just tossed out, you know, onto the page. Maybe, 
I don't know, I wasn't there, but regardless of how it happened, this is what the end result is, and it really, really works. It's the perfect coffee table art book. Every time you flip this open, you can leave it laying around, you flip it open, every time there's something new. The only real cohesion going on here is a chronological one, as it's broken up into chapters over the various editions, and it works perfectly fine. And because I'm looking at this as an art book for the art, I must be looking through the work and seeing the improvement in the art, you would think. You'd think I'd be looking at the, the new stuff going, oh my God, this is so much better than the older stuff, but uh, not really. I don't know how much of this is nostalgia. Is that what makes me like the front half of this book more? Is it nostalgia? I don't know. In the more modern years, you can really see the emergence of a type of house style. And I feel like a lot of the whimsy is lost in that. You have a lot more whimsy in the older work. I don't know what this is. I don't know if it's a, a certain naivete. I'm not really sure what it is. I don't know the magic secret sauce going on in here. Is it nostalgia? Is it just me? Is it the house style? Is that kind of coldness of, of, of really structuring a brand, sucking some of the this un, unmeasurable juice out of it that leaves a little bit lacking? I'm not entirely sure. One thing that's really cool though is that there's these great spreads throughout it here for instance, like this, showing the evolution of the art with some monsters. Now here's where it gets interesting to me. We can look objectively at this art and it appears this final most modern form. is It's obviously the most slick and polished and technically superior in execution, yada, yada, yada. However, I'd like to make a case for the effectiveness of this earlier, more naive art, I guess we could say. So imagine you have a party of adventurers, right? One of them is trying to tell the rest about some impossible creature that he saw. And we're going to break the fourth wall for a moment because what he does is he's just gonna read from the, uh, the 1977 AD&D monster manual and because what he's seen is a demogorgon. So this is what he, this is what he tells the, the members of his party. He says, it is contended by some that this demon prince is supreme and in any event he is awesome in his power. This gigantic demon is 18 feet tall and reptilian. Demogorgon has two heads which bear the visages of evil baboons or perhaps mandrills with the hideous coloration of the latter name beasts. His blue green skin is plated with snake like scales. His body and neck are those of a giant lizard. His twin necks resemble snakes and his thick tail is forked. Rather than having arms, he has great tentacles. His appearance testifies to his command of cold-blooded things such as serpents, reptiles, and octopi. At which point they all look at each other and they think, okay, can anyone here draw? And they go, oh yeah, let's get the, let's get the bard. Let's get that weird bard guy he can draw. So they, they dig him up he goes to work and he comes back with that description and he produces this. And that makes sense. And so now you know that this is an interpretation of a, a, a unimaginable strange creature. You know this is merely an interpretation. If this was a photo, it wouldn't work as well because what it does is because it's an interpretation, because it's doing half the work for you, because you know it's so flawed. Your imagination needs to do the rest. It's like the art from the old medieval maps where some sailor caught a glimpse of a Norwal and he's like, it's a, uh, it's a horse out in the sea with a horn and a tail like a unicorn, but it's got like fins and stuff. That's what's out there. So it's, it's important to leave these gaps because then you end up with stuff like this. It's people trying to uh, find a language for their imagination and you don't want imagination to be on rails. And this, I think in a way, I'd love to be able to measure the neurons that are firing in somebody who's seeing an image like this and an image like this. And which one lights up that imagination part of the brain more? Because I would suggest it's actually the work that is a bit more naive. Just my thoughts on this. I don't know. In closing with this kind of thing, I guess D&D is a pen and paper game. So it only seems fitting 
that art made with a pen and paper works the best. But that's of course just to me. You guys let me know what you think in the comments below. Maybe I just went on a big sideways, you know, thing, but there's something in there that is so interesting to me that I feel like you can just talk about for hours. So that's that. <laughs> but the variety of the work in this collection is also what makes it so interesting. I love the modern stuff. I think it's great. Some of it isn't really my taste and feels a little bit, um, it's not what I think when I think of d and I guess I think of it from, again, say back in the 80s, which is maybe inspired by a, a bit more of a realistic uh, Tolkien type thing where a longsword is a longsword and it's not some kind of giant anime thing. But this is maybe just personal taste. And hey, again, it, it's such an open thing because it's d and it, It's what you make it. It's how you want to have a blast with this kind of play in this sandbox and have fun. Now, I haven't said much about the writing in this, and honestly, this isn't to take away from the work that they've done in putting this together, but the writing isn't necessarily the biggest selling point for me here. This, as it says right on the cover, is a visual history. It's a history as told through the art and the visuals surrounding this brand. And that's what the most is the most interesting to me. And yes, there is some cool stuff in here about the history and, and the different things that were happening culturally at the time and how the Dungeons and Dragons brand responded to that kind of stuff and how they wanted to, you know, get out there more into the zeitgeist with with the population and that and, and the different tactics and the angles that they went with. And that stuff is absolutely interesting. But the other, the great Thing about this and what makes it work so well is that you can really just rely on the visual imagery here to tell the story and the history of Dungeons and Dragons. And again, that's just another reason why this book works so well. It's really interesting stuff on that level, just as a, a an artifact of the last few decades in our contemporary pop culture. Just that in itself is really interesting. So uh, uh, there's a ton of reasons why I love this thing. But yeah, it, it, end of the day, just just buy it. It's really, really good. There'll be some links below to some of my stuff. If you want to uh, see what I'm up to and what I'm doing and all that jazz, go check that out. And uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Really cool to have you uh, come and hang out for a bit and uh, talk about some D&D. &D. So all right, all the best. Cheers.